Um, hi there, everyone. Thank you very much for coming. My name is Jeffrey Salvador. I'm the co-president of the Political Science uh, Department Undergraduate Group. Um, we are very excited um, to be here for the second uh, part of our political um, election series. Um, we had the first part uh, in September, and uh, now the results are in. Um, and we are here to discuss what happened uh, and why and where do we go from here. Um, so I'm, as, uh, as uh, someone who worked uh, very hard in this election, I certainly have my, my, I would like to know the answers to that one too. Uh, so I'm very excited to introduce uh, Professor Wendy Schiller, the Chair of the Political Science Department and Professor of Political Science and International and Public Affairs, and Professor Mark Blythe, the Eastman Professor of Political Economy and Professor of Political Science and International and Public Affairs. Uh, please join me in welcoming them today. Oh, and it, if I may, um, we'll have time for uh, a couple questions at the end. And those of you watching in overflow rooms, um, please feel free to come down. And we, we want to incorporate your questions into the event as well. And, and uh, how long are we going today? Uh, till 5.30. Till 5.30. Yes. Okay. Plenty of time for questions. Can't okay. you set up, have you got a Twitter account on your phone? Yeah. All right, so why don't you set up a hashtag and get people in the other rooms to send questions to that hashtag? Okay, it's uh, hashtag brown poli sci. Uh, yeah. we'll we'll, if you tweet at that, we'll I'll be looking at it. Then we'll get questions. It. Yeah, hashtag brown poli sci. Great. Okay, well, welcome. I think um, we first gave a talk in September together. Uh, I think both of us are um, a little surprised at the outcome of the election last night. No, um, no, no. But he's not. But uh, I am. I'm not stunned, though. I'm not stunned. I'm surprised, but not stunned. And I want everybody to take a deep breath with me, deep breath. Um, those of us who are older in the room I have some perspective on history on these elections. Those of us who are younger, those of you who are younger, um, I want to just say that, as I said to my Introduction to American Politics class this morning, um, if it's your first major campaign that you were involved with and you were on the Clinton side, uh, you know, it can be rather devastating to incur, you know, to suffer this loss when you're so mobilized and so excited. But I'm much older than you and I too uh, incurred some, uh, a pretty big loss on my first presidential campaign and I got over it and I stayed engaged and I want to reiterate uh, both uh, the President's remarks, uh, President uh, Obama's remarks, and Secretary of State Clinton's remarks today, uh, that it's, it's vitally important, as bad as it feels for you today, those of you who worked on the Clinton campaign, um, how bad you feel, you need to absolutely stay engaged. And I'm going to take, when we talk about the implications of this, I'm going to talk a lot about the ways I think you can stay engaged and stay effective. Um, and, you know, learn how to lose a presidential election, because in your lifetime, you will lose more than one. Um, whatever side of the political fence you're on, uh, God willing, you live long enough. So, what happened? Well, I, I can tell you that as soon as we saw that Virginia was too close to call at about 8.30 last night, uh, I think those of us who watch elections knew that it was going to be a difficult night for, uh, for Secretary of State Clinton. Why? <laughs> because uh, the polling had shown a very solid, healthy lead in Virginia for a long time, and what was clear from the get-go was that um, the amount of support indicated by voters in polling was not matching up with voter support. And why did that happen? Were the polls really wrong? Um, either the polls from three weeks ago or the polls that we had, for example, in Pennsylvania for the last four or five months. I'm not persuaded the polls were entirely off. What I'm persuaded by is that the people who said they would vote for Trump were more committed to voting for Trump, literally getting out the door and voting for Trump, than the people who said they were going or intending to vote for Clinton. Something happened with the people who said they were going to vote for Clinton. They meant it when they said it, but there was drop-off. Either there was drop-off, as we know, in turnout among some constituencies in some states, but also people deciding either at the last minute not to vote at all for president or actually to vote for Trump. So I think in the terms of the polling, that's what happened. When we look at states such as Wisconsin and Pennsylvania and Michigan, which is still sort of in dispute, uh, and Virginia even, and Florida, these margins are incredibly small. This is one of the tightest presidential elections in my lifetime. It's not quite as tight as Al Gore versus George W. Bush in 2000, but it's very, very tight. 59 million, give or take, uh, voters voted for Donald Trump, 59 million, give or take, voted for Hillary Clinton. 
There's a couple of hundred thousand in there either way. But generally, that is a very, very close election. You can't attribute this to a failure in turnout machinery. Uh, certainly, Hillary Clinton had a phenomenal organization. That was supposed to be her big um, uh, claim to fame in this election. Donald Trump did not have the same kind of organization with the Republicans, and so traditional campaign watchers believe that he couldn't overcome that organizational advantage in areas that were already favorable to Hillary Clinton, notably um, uh, the suburbs of Philadelphia, the suburbs of Pittsburgh, uh, uh, Madison, Wisconsin, Milwaukee, areas that were favorable. Certainly those areas were favorable to Hillary Clinton, but she did not rack up the lead in those areas that could overcome the turnout among typically lower educated people without a college education don't turn out in quite the same numbers as college educated. Their turnout was higher. And she did not, uh, the big polling number that gave people confidence in her victory was the, the gap between college educated and not college educated in terms of approval of favorability. She was leading initially by 15 points among college educated women. That lead went down to about you know ten points or something or eight points among college educated women, and um, among college educated men, she was uh, at one point leading among all college educated people, but leading a little bit, um, and she lost that group too. Um, and so uh, you have to ask yourself how you know how did that happen? What was the trigger that made people decide in the end of the day that they weren't going to vote for Hillary Clinton? Uh, generally, you know, instinctively you can think about your anecdotal conversations with people and you can think about all these sorts of reasons. And I think trying to come up with one is a mistake. I think for some people it might have had something to do with gender. Um, uh, for a lot of others it would have had to do with party defection. People, as I said in September, go home to their parties. It is very tough to get people to cast a vote against um, your own party. It, to go for the other side. So I never believe that a lot of Republicans would defect to Clinton. I figured they wouldn't cast a vote in that top ballot for president, or they wouldn't vote at all. I didn't think that they would go over to Clinton. She needed a few of them to do that, particularly among college-educated whites, and she didn't. African-American turnout was generally fairly high. Um, it was lower in some areas of the country, particularly North Carolina. There have been a lot of efforts made by the North Carolina State Legislature to limit African American turnout, both in early voting across the board for Democrats, but also in the number and location of polling places. So political scientists and others will have to do some real studying on that and um, try to confirm that. But I think by all accounts, that's one of the factors, at least in North Carolina. But in Florida, for example, in Miami-Dade, African American turnout was at 2012 levels. So while the turnout among African Americans was slightly lower um, and the loyalty to uh, Hillary Clinton was slightly lower, I don't think you can attribute the loss of the election uh, in states like Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, Michigan uh, to that phenomenon. I think the other problem for her among particularly college-educated uh, women, perhaps, or even just college-educated people in general that typically vote Republican but might have flipped or who are independent, like New Hampshire. Um, the prospect of continued congressional investigations, whether you believe these scandals were manufactured or not, uh, the prospect of having incredible gridlock in the Congress, between the Congress and the President, and having an administration that was bringing a lot of past experience, but also a lot of past baggage in with her, may have turned just enough voters off in certain precincts and counties in some of these states to cost her the election. That doesn't make it Hillary Clinton's fault, but it does, it does present a reality of the Republican effort over the last six years, you could even say 10 years, to obstruct and to block and to delay. And I think when people thought about the prospect of another four years of that, the irony is that it probably worked in the Republicans' favor. Well, let's just get a fresh start. You know, how bad can Trump be? I think a lot of people figured that it, he would come in with no prior government scandals, not to say he doesn't have personal issues, but no government prior scandals, and that, in fact, the Congress wouldn't be able to stand still with the Trump presidency because if they maintain Congress, 
um, there would be a unified Republican government. And I will talk about the implications of a unified Republican government when we talk about the implications of this election. Um, and uh, going back to that question, uh, again, given the prospect of that, you also saw, I think, to the Democrats' dismay, uh, the, uh, straight ticket voting. Democrats were hoping for more split ticket voting in North Carolina and Pennsylvania in particular, that the Trump effect would be negative. One of the most surprising uh, results was Russ Feingold losing as badly as he did to the incumbent Ron Johnson. None of that showed up in the polling. He was a fairly weak incumbent. Clearly, Trump carried him in. In the way that Ron, Russ Feingold was supposed to give Wisconsin to Hillary with the progressives, uh, he, he carried her in. Um, millennials voted, um, uh, the majority of millennials voted for Hillary Clinton, about 54%. Um, and the same number is true for 40 to 50. But uh, other millennials voted for Trump or third party. And if you add up all of those and you could identify in which states millennials voted that way, you might make an argument that that cost her one of these states. Not sure it would have cost her all the states, but it cost her one of the states. So I think in the end of the day, um, 24 years of public life and public service and public vitriol and public attacks, I think, can become a liability that is more difficult to overcome than a lot of people thought. And uh, that wouldn't have played with the people under 40, but the people over 40 vote in, in bigger numbers. So I think that was an issue. Another surprise, 29% of the Latino vote uh, went to Trump. That was surprising, given that Romney only won 26% of the Latino vote, and the rest of the vote, 65% of the Latino vote, according to the New York Times exit polls, went to Hillary Clinton. Latino turnout in Florida was massively higher than it was in 2012. So it was not a Latino turnout issue in Florida. And Nevada, you can argue, went to Clinton because of Latino turnout. But even just three percentage difference in loyalty, given the margin in Florida, the margin was a little higher in Florida than Virginia, uh, and Virginia reversing, she won. But even that, you know, if you, if you multiply that, particularly in North Carolina, even a small percentage Latino vote, that can matter. So it was the demographics where she lost a few votes, a few thousand votes here and there that cost her some of these states that cost her the election. So, um, uh, I thought that uh, Trump's uh, uh, quote-unquote victory speech was actually much more measured than most people would have thought. And I think Clinton's speech today, uh, especially to young people, was quite good and quite inspiring, as was the president's speech. People might have thought the president was slightly cavalier, but I don't think he was trying to be cavalier. I think he was trying to encourage people that this is one election of many. There will be those in the future. There have been those in the past. And how we would deal with that in the future would have a lot to do with the impact of the election. So I think I'll leave it at there. I have a lot to say about the implications of the election, um, but you want to talk about what you think happened? Sure. So I wasn't surprised at all. Um, many of you have been sat here in this room with me where I've spoken about global Trumpism and various things like this. The first time I came out publicly and said I thought that he would win was at a Watson event in May last year. Uh, I did an interview in Greece that went viral when I predicted both Brexit and Trump. And it's not because I have a clear, voyant crystal ball sitting under my bed or I made a pact with Satan to see the future in a mirror. It's simply, it's, it's pretty obvious if you think about it in a more global way. This is not a local event. Everything that Professor Schiller just said is true about this election, but Brexit happened. There's a left-wing version of this that brought us Greece. There's the shrinkage of center party votes across the entire OECD. There's the collapse of left-wing parties' votes, in particular, across Western Europe. Uh, coming up next, Renzi is going to fail in Italy in the referendum that's coming up, which will cause a constitutional crisis in Italy. Shortly after that, we have the French election coming up. I would like to remind you of the following statistics. Uh, the lowest George Bush ever got, George Bush uh, Jr. got as president in, uh, in uh, his uh, approval rating was 29%. The president of France currently has an approval rating of 4%. And the National Front have nearly 40% of the intended vote. So even with the design of the French Constitution, which makes it very difficult and you have to have a second round, etc., the most popular political party by a factor of two in France is the National Front. After that, we have the German elections coming up. Merkel is vulnerable. 
How is all of this going to play out, and what has it all connected? Here's a simple way of thinking about it. From 1945 until 1975, we targeted a particular economic variable called full employment. And there's a thing called the Lucas Critique, which basically says if you keep targeting something, people will game it. And they did. Unions gamed it, employers gamed it, and the result was inflation. And after a while, that inflation became painful, painful enough for the people who were hurt by it, who were the creditor classes in these countries, to band together and fund a market-friendly revolution. And they liberated finance, and they deregulated banks, and they integrated the economies of the world. And they globalized labor such that labor could no longer demand that it gets its share of productivity, because if you don't, I'll just move your job somewhere else. And all of those trade agreements that were signed, the globalization, which is inevitable and we can't roll back, you know you can go on the web and type in WTO text, and you'll find that it's a very long 700-page legal agreement that took five years to thrash out between corporate interests, lawyers, lobbyists, with very little input from civil society. The same is true of the EU's agreements on capital movements, the banking union, take your pick. And there's a moment when people just began to figure out that for the past... 30 years, going from 1985 until now, huge amounts of money have been generated in the global economy, and as we know from the work of Thomas Piketty and others, most of it's gone up to a tiny fraction of the population. So there's been a huge amount of growth, but hardly anyone's benefited. You don't have to go far to see this. Get off the east side. Go to the west side of Providence. Go to northwest Providence and walk into neighbourhoods which have check cashing agencies, fried chicken joints, pawn shops broken down, fix your mobile and networks you've never heard of stores. That's the reality for people, not just here, in many, many countries. So they're a bit fed up of this. And they've decided at any possible opportunity, whether it's Brexit, the Italian constitutional referendum or anything, to basically give their elites notice that we've had enough of this. And that's what this is. Now, there's a macroeconomic underpinning to this one, too, because after we decided to target 30, uh, on full employment for 30 years, we decided to target inflation for 30 years. I don't see why the Lucas critique doesn't actually apply to that one as well. And we've managed to create a world in which you can dump 13 trillion euros into the global money supply through quantitative easing and other programs, and there's no inflation anywhere. And here's your problem. When you've levered up your banking system and bailed it out, dumped it on the public purse and said you need to cut that terrible debt, when people's <laughs> personal balance sheets are still bloated from the, all, the, all the credit they took on in the 2000s, and they don't have wage growth, and there's no inflation to ease the burden of the debt, then the creditors fight harder to get their money back. Whether it's the case of Germany versus the rest of the Eurozone, whether it's the form of the creditor class versus the debtor class, what we have everywhere are creditor-debtor standoffs. And those credit or debtor standoffs take different forms. For the left, it takes the form of Podemos. For the right, it takes the form of the National Front. And for Trump, which has a weird coalition, which is of course sexist and of course racist and of course anti-immigrant and all the rest of it. But one part of it is, if you look at the states that really fell hard, the Rust Belt, it's economic. Now, if you recognize that simple fact, you can put Trump in there with Brexit. You can put Trump in there with Jeremy Corbyn. You can put him in with all the rest of it. And I'll leave you one set of numbers that I found today, which I think is just an absolute clangor for this whole thing. In 2015, Wall Street bonuses, not regular compensation, bonuses, seven years after they were bailed out with the public purse, totaled, when I get this right, $28.4 billion. Total compensation paid to every single person in this country who earns a minimum wage, $14 billion. I'll stop there. Um, okay. Um, <laughs> so, uh, um, so I want to give, so uh, I want to talk about the implications and I want to talk a little bit about um, the economic disconnect. And I think it's really important um, to look at this historically, the way political parties use uh, economic and racial wedges to win votes. This has been going on since the very beginning, but certainly, um, certainly after the Civil War and Reconstruction and then Jim Crow and then all the way through the 30s and you, especially in places like Louisiana, um, famous Huey Long, uh, pitted 
white people who were poor against black people who were poor in Louisiana. And all the Southern, uh, there's a book by V.O. Key called Southern um, State and Nation, and he details this, I mean, really in, in depth. And you think about this way in which even in the 18, late 1800s, uh, prior immigrant groups would pit themselves against the newer immigrant groups, both for position in society but also economic gains. America has a history of pitting one group against the other. And there's no question in the Trump campaign that he did that on multiple levels with multiple groups. And the Clinton campaign pitched to sort of the, the greater good in Americans, right? How could you support somebody who would do this? And in some ways, you wanted to sort of go with that, that plea, but on the other, it ignored what was strategic history throughout the history of the country and how parties win votes. So the economic factor that I think uh, Mark Blythe is pointing out that is absolutely on, uh, spot on is also intermixed, of course, with race, uh, nation of origin, immigrant status, and gender. But when you're thinking about your own little enclave and what we know in political science from the work of, of uh, Sean Theriault and some others is that we now not, don't just have political polarization, we have residential political segregation. Mm -hmm. People go to live in places where they think people think like them politically which is really striking. We still don't have mobility in terms of race. We still have discrimination in the housing market. But on top of that, we have people who go live in liberal areas because they think people think like them. And they want their kids to grow up in those neighborhoods. We know these examples of friends who may either, oh, I've never met a Republican. I've never met a Democrat. They go, oh my gosh, you're 17. There is a world out there. That happens here in America. So you can imagine how the reverb happens in a campaign when you have a neighborhood or a community that is marked by similar characteristics, maybe working class, maybe the same economic, maybe the same profession, same. And then you surround yourself with people like you, not just racially, but also politically. And what the Democrats estimated was that the people who were like that Democrats, 2008, 2012, would stay Democrats in 2016. And too few of them stayed loyal to the Democratic Party because the messaging did not resonate sufficiently with them. I think the tie to Wall Street was very effective. Donald Trump sort of played himself, portrayed himself as a guy who played Wall Street, right? Going bankrupt, borrowing money, going bankrupt, borrowing money, not paying it back, you know, getting good deals. He always gets a great deal. It was the antithesis of what the Obama slash Clinton mm -hmm. um, team is, right? I mean, so uh, President Obama did the best he could, I think, with the economic crisis, but it is still true that bankers and banks made a lot of money, then they were bailed out, then they were forgiven, and then um, they paid a lot, billions and billions of dollars in fines, by the way, billions of dollars in fines, but as you point out, they themselves didn't appear to suffer. And this mattered to the Democratic constituency. It mattered not just to uh, white people, by the way. Talk to African Americans in Cleveland, by the way. There was a whole, whole section of Cleveland that was preyed upon in subprime, subprime mortgages and lost their home. So this is sort of a brewing discontent on the Democratic side. Mm -hmm. So the Republicans were always mobilized, but the Democrats were a brewing discontent. And I think she tried to reach them, but it's hard to reach them when you don't have the policies that she enacted. She was Secretary of State, of course, not Secretary of Commerce or Labor, and it was hard to get those bona fides. Giving the speeches to Wall Street wasn't that big a deal, but it didn't help. And so when you add that up, people say to themselves, Trump's my voice, Trump's going to get me back my job or get me a better way of life. The other thing that I also said in September that I still hold true, which is really important for people at Brown, is that Social change has moved incredibly quickly, and we have to sort of understand that some people, a lot of people, have not caught up. And that the world they live in and the social attitudes they have are, remain to them something they value, that they respect. We in society that want to move forward progressively ask them to change some of those values and ideas. And it's come down basically as a fiat from the Supreme Court in some ways with same-sex marriage, for example. That doesn't mean same-sex marriage isn't the right thing to do. But what it means is if you're the Democratic Party, you have to go back and you have to figure out a way to integrate the people that you supported you for 40 years and social change. And it's not that easy to do. 
Um, so I want to talk a little bit about the implications. This is not going to be popular, what I'm about to say, but that's okay. In the, I'm going to live with that. Um, two things. Uh, I grew up uh, in the Ronald Reagan era. That was my political socialization. And I know uh, most of you are too young to remember that, but I can tell you that I, I grew up uh, as a Democrat. I'm now an, a registered independent. That may also happen to you as you get older. But uh, it's very important that you recognize that if you were a Democrat and you were liberal in 1980, or 1984 in particular, you were devastated by Walter Mondale's complete disaster of an election where he lost almost all states. You thought, there's no way, how could America elect Ronald Reagan again? How could this happen? Don't people see through him? Couldn't they understand? My 19-year-old, 20-year-old self is screaming to myself in my head, how could this have happened? And how will I live through it? How will I get through it? Um, and he had people like Ed Meese as attorney general. This was a bad guy. He was a bad guy. He's a bad <laughs> attorney general. I mean, he had cabinet members that were bad. I'm just prefacing who Trump might put into the cabinet. They were bad. They were bad. But somehow, America got through that. There were damaging policies. There was damage done. No question about it. And by 2000, I'm sorry, 19, I'm so old, 1986, American people, the House is already Democratic in the Senate elections of 1986. After six years of Ronald Reagan, they were a wipeout for the Republicans. They lost eight Senate seats, and the Democrats took the Senate back. So there will be a pendulum in this in your lifetime. You will lose a devastating election that will keep you depressed for quite some time. This may be it. But this is, there's a long life cycle in American politics, and you have to remember that. And one of the most important things, if you, if you are a Clinton supporter or if you ascribe as an independent or a Democrat, separate from Trump, the Republican Party has been very, very good, even going back to 2006 against George Bush on immigration reform, but further going in when Obama gets elected at obstruction. Obstruction and delay. And obstruction and delay. And shutting down the government. And feeding the rhetoric that Trump I would say exacerbated or expanded, but certainly the implicit messages against the other were very much ever present in the Republican platform. That goes back to Reagan, but it was resurrected in the last 10 years with some force by the Republican Party. And I call this the era of blameless obstruction. Why was it blameless? Because they did not suffer any electoral consequences, really. In 2010, they won the House back on the Tea Party and this rhetoric against Obamacare. In 2012, they lost the White House, but that's a bigger reach. And in 2014, the Republicans regained the Senate based on the same, the, ba the government's bad, shut it down, block it, block it, shut it down. And that was easy to do because they did not have the White House. And voters did not blame the Republicans for wage stagnation. They didn't blame them for the failure of retraining programs for people <laughs> over the age of 50 that needed retraining. They didn't blame them on corporate low taxes or, ex or, or patriation of jobs overseas. They didn't blame them because the Republicans were very, very good at blaming the Obama administration. They cannot do that anymore. The Republicans own the government now. <laughs> They are unified party government from top to bottom. They cannot blame the African-American president. They cannot blame the female president. What you look forward to, and I mean forward as in the future, not with great anticipation, <laughs> what you see is finally these, there will be policies you object to. There will be things that they try to do as a party that you as a Democrat may say, I don't want that to happen. But they will own it. There will be no way around it. And that is very important for the party system. It's very important for the congressional functionality in our system. You, you may say, I don't want Congress to do anything because I don't like who controls Congress. You can't think that way. If the House of Representatives cannot bring bills to the floor, the government cannot function. The government is too big for that. So you need the House Majority Party and the Senate Majority Party to be able to function. You need them to bring bills up even so that you can fight the legislation that you don't like that they propose. But then voters in Pennsylvania and Wisconsin and Florida will see who is running the country. 
and they may reward the Republicans in 2018, which is the next electoral cycle, which by the way, if you're political, you always wake up the next day and say, when is the next regularly scheduled election? And unlike Britain, we have them <laughs> regularly scheduled. I can tell you when they'll be in 2018 and 2020. And you have to pick yourself off the floor and say, okay, what are the venues that I can operate in to fight what I see as injustice or bad policy now, but gear up for the next political election? And in that election, for the first time in a very long time, since 2006, Democrats can run against a unified Republican government that may or may not deliver on the vast promises that Donald Trump has made. First, they have to get along with Donald Trump. Now, all the Republicans will fall in line because he's their president. He is the president of the United States elect. He will be everybody's president January 20th. They will publicly fall in line, but it is not at all clear to me how much they will support what he wants to do. He may go too far to the left for the Republicans in the Freedom Caucus just by wanting to spend money on infrastructure. Donald Trump builds things and he puts his name on it. What better use of time as president to build more things and put more of your name on it? I'm serious about this. He's going to want to do things. And he's not going to want to wait for Congress to figure out to appropriate money. So now we've had di such intense difficulty appropriating money for basic things in the federal government. Now he's going to want more. His list yesterday in his victory speech were things Republicans cringe at. They don't want to spend money on any of that. This is going to be a test of party loyalty and party unity. There'll be a honeymoon period. But by the time you get to February, March, when the budget starts to be written, things could go off the rails in these two, which means that Trump may say, well, if you don't cooperate with me, I'll cooperate with the Democrats. You have no idea how this is going to go. I think party accountability is incredibly important in, in an American system, which is further removed from meeting the individual you vote for than ever before. Congressional districts are 711,000 people. They will be probably maybe close to a million people in the next redistricting. You can't meet these people. You can't see these people in most states. So in order for us to be able to hold government accountable, it has to be clear who is in charge and who's responsible for delivering. And that is, this is the first time in 10 years that the Republicans will face that task. And it's unclear to me at this point that they are going to be cohesive and united on all the things either that Trump promised to do, good and bad, and what they always like to do. The Democrats will have to be a loyal opposition. They are that now. They're going to have to marshal their forces in big ways. Um, in terms of foreign policy, I'll say something else that isn't going to be particularly popular, but an unpredictable president when it comes to the use of force is not always a terrible thing. There were lots of ways in which Ronald Reagan was not well received by the rest of the world, but in one way, one thing that people thought about him was he might just be crazy enough to do something serious. I don't think he was crazy, but I think he was unpredictable. And Trump is unpredictable. And in terms of the use of force, that may not always, depending on who you're dealing with in the world, be a terrible thing. Um, last on the implications. Oh, what do you do next? Before I take a question, before we go to Mark. Um, what do you do next? As I said, you stay engaged. And I think a lesson for your generation that's really important that my generation had to learn in the 80s is that politics and the government is not the only way to affect change. That you want to work through your communities, whatever they are. You want to work through no local organizations, nonprofits, non-governmental agencies. You want to make somebody's life better, you know, train them, get them a job, educate them, tutor them, help them out economically. You don't have to look to the government to make all that happen. You can make that happen now. And the counterforce of that kind of activity is a strong one. It helps to not only improve people's lives, but also um, talk to people you might not otherwise meet. And talk to people who might believe the government shouldn't do this, but they want to do it in the private sector. There might be cross connections you can make to people whom you don't agree with politically. Don't give up on all those venues, because they're important venues. And don't give up on the political venue. The idea is not to crawl away and say, woe is us. The idea is to sort of pick yourself up, as the president said today, um, and get back out there, and keep fighting for what you believe in, and keep trying to win elections, but also recognize that the venues to win elections, local city council, state legislature, governor, all these things matter. And you want to make sure that you keep that commitment to stay engaged. Because you will find you will survive this defeat, and you will want to be empowered. 
And it won't just be for one election, it'll be for all elections. And so I really urge you um, to keep that in mind and try to turn your attention, if you can, as soon as you can, to those other ways in which you might be effective. So, hmm. I think the Wall Street issue goes much deeper than this. If you download from WikiLeaks um, the Podesta emails and start searching for place names, something very interesting happens. One of the place names that comes up the most is Martha's Vineyard. Another one that comes up after that is Davos. Another one that comes after that is Washington, D.C. And then basically the distribution of real places where real people actually live disappears into the tail. Um, this, the, we talk about the Democrats, the Democratic Party. I don't know who that is. I know that there's a bunch of people who have made very, very nice six-figure careers in D.C. bouncing from agency to agency, starting wars, getting promoted, never actually paying the cost for it, waiting for the next administration to give them another pay hike. And I see a lot of that, and you just spend any time in D.C. and you bump into them all the time. Let me read you a little bit from what Thomas Frank had to say about this today in The Guardian. There's an even larger problem here. It's a kind of chronic complacency that's been rotting American liberalism for years. A hubris that tells Democrats they need do nothing different. They need deliver nothing to anyone, really, except their friends on the Google jet and those nice people at Goldman. The rest of us are treated as though we have nowhere else to go and no role to play except to vote enthusiastically on the grounds that these Democrats are the last thing standing between us and the end of the world. It's a liberalism of the rich and it's failed the middle class and it's failed in terms of its own electability. Enough with these comfortable Democrats and their cozy Washington system. Enough with Clintonism and its prideful air of professional class virtue. Enough. That's coming from a left commentator, not a right commentator. So I'm not even sure who the Democrats are that are going to mount this challenge, who the people that they're going to connect with, the social organizations, the movements, the youth. How do they touch them when they barely only talk to each other and no one else on the way out to Davos or Martha's Vineyard to commune with the guys at Goldman that are funding the party? Let's talk a few other consequences. In the summer, if you weren't paying close attention to American politics, or if, you, if you're a European, I got quite a few calls from Europeans, friends of mine from email, and they would say, why are you guys obsessed with bathrooms? Because it seems that Obama's legacy from an outside point of view, now of course I get what's going on here, right? You're basically saying states cannot decide who persons are. This is actually an incredibly important issue, but it's done about bathrooms and who gets to go to a bathroom, right? Now let's think about people who really don't have the time or the inkling to figure out that this is actually a really important civil rights issue. It sounds ridiculous. And so much of what Democrats spend their time on might be good, but sounds ridiculous. And let's think about what Obama's actually doing for his legacy. You know they were saying that he was going to ram TTIP through a lame duck session of Congress? A free trade agreement. You know that thing that lots of people are upset about? Let's go to Europe for a minute. Zygmunt Gabriel, the head of the Social Democrats. I was at his shop three weeks ago. I said, where's Zygmunt? He was in Wallonia campaigning for a free trade agreement with Canada. This is the head of the Social Democratic Party. When their job is carrying water for corporations to get investor protection treaties and then going out to gold, go, go, commune with Goldman where the money is, well, why would you believe in them? I think the credibility problem here is absolutely enormous. Now, let's think about other things that have happened in the past that we have responsibility for that we never think about. The financial crisis, the Commodity Futures Modernization Act, <laughs> the deliberate discount of any information that anything to do with banks and finance wasn't good, the idea that we can't prick asset bubbles because we don't really know their asset bubbles. Really? My dead cat Biggie knew there was a housing bubble and he didn't have a PhD in economics. So we're left with a technocracy and a bunch of political people who don't recognize politics, who are unwilling to engage in politics because they'd love to think that everything's just a policy problem to be slide ruled out of existence. So let's think about the short term consequences and a bit longer one here. So knowing that this was going to happen, I had shorts on in the market. So I was short US dollar and I was short S&P 500. But on Friday, I took the shorts off because I started to think about, well, hang on a second. Let's say he wins. For me to make any money off this, because I don't have billions of dollars to play with and I can't afford to take leverage in the wrong direction, how am I going to do this with my paltry little bit of a gamble? Well, if you think about the companies that are going to benefit from Trump, there's actually a lot of them and they disproportionately weight the S&P 500. So banks. Now, why are banks going to start loving this? Because Dodd-Frank is going to die. 
that much is clear. Healthcare companies, they're going to love it because Obamacare is going to die. Infrastructure companies are going to love it because we are going to spend money on that and we're going to be able to do it because we're going to do it in the form of tax cuts, which is going to bloat the deficit and is going to be negative on US bonds. But it doesn't matter because there's nowhere else to go except the US dollar unless you want to buy German bonds that are already negatively yielding. So we will export our problems to the rest of the world as we usually do. So in the short term, you can tell a story that makes sense as to why today, after this guy gets elected, the, the US... The U not just the stock market is up, all the indexes are up, and the US dollar is up. <laughs> and that's after we elected that guy. So you want to think about consequences, you've got to think very hard about exactly how this plays out. A couple of other things are going to happen. There's going to be a tax deal with US corporations. They're going to get a sweetheart deal. They'll probably pay a 10% penalty rate bringing back their taxes. After that, everybody's happy because they win and we slightly win. What will we use that money to do? To basically balance the books on the tax cuts that we're going to give and they're already going to go once again to the overwhelmingly well off. Second thing that's going to happen, as I've said, Obamacare has gone, Dodd-Frank has gone. What does that mean? It means we're going to start generating excessive leverage in the financial sector again. And there's a real problem here, which is, uh, I'm not going to go into now, but happy answering the question, uh, and, uh, question um, and answer. There's a huge move into passive modes of investment, basically not active management. And there's a strategy called smart beta strategies, which people are pursuing, which is increasing massive amounts of correlation in financial markets again. And if you push leverage into that system, you basically create 2008 all over again. And the last one that I want to talk about as a domestic one is both Bernie Sanders and Donald Trump have been equally dishonest on this. There is no renaissance of manufacturing in the United States. Right. It's not going to happen. At the end of the day, manufacturing works in a very simple way. <laughs> capital substitutes for labor at the margin. And the more capital you have, the less labor you need. Look at German Mittelstand. Employment's going like this. Output's going like this. We live in a world where literally 10% of the global population could provide superabundance for everyone. We have a distributional problem and a political problem. We do not have a problem of where you're going to make your stuff in factories. The notion that we're going to rebuild all these factories, the plant suppliers, the equipment manufacturers, what, so that people can get lung disease and asbestosis again? Is that actually the plan? I think this is tremendously dishonest to say that's going to happen. And then finally on foreign policy. I mentioned that the Italians are going to be in trouble soon. The French could really be in trouble. There's a whole host of things going on, German elections coming up. I used to worry about the future of the euro so much so that I wrote a book about it. I don't worry about the euro. I think that stays. I worry about the EU itself. I think that is desperately unstable and desperately fragile because it rests upon a technocratic consensus that the Commission can run things and the ECB is the best one to run economic policy and nobody buys that anymore. So the legitimacy gap is absolutely huge and the performance gap is absolutely huge. And the final one, your friend and mine, Vladimir Putin. Because on the one hand, and this is where I will actually go very much with Professor Schiller here, I actually think that the, uh, let's call them the, um, the neoliberal but nonetheless humanist internationalist interventionist Democrats who have been running foreign policy for the past decade and a half have been an absolute disaster. <coughs> They haven't solved Iraq. They continue to do the same things. They're still blowing up Afghanistan. There's no end in sight. We're dropping drones on people without responsibility or oversight. This isn't going anywhere. So if anybody, they're also incredibly hostile to Russia. They've expanded all the way, NATO all the way up to the borders. You've given tiny little states in the Baltic F-15 fighters just to piss them off. You're putting radar installations to look for non-existent missiles from the Middle East coming from Iran. And then you've got Putin on the other side of that. So in the short term, Taking that off the table might actually not be bad. That's why they're delighted. But here's your long-term problem. What if Donald thinks he's a super smart guy and he's got a good deal with Vladimir and everything's going on and Vladimir says, ha ha, watch this, and he invades the Baltics? What does he do then? There's your risk factor. Consequence of that. Yeah, I, th I think that you raised a, a couple of good points. I'm not, I think that Donald Trump's going to ask for outright money for infrastructure, so I do think that the tax cuts plus the asks are going to uh, trigger the deficit hawks in the Republican Party who, who stand usually firm against spending money, so I think that's going to create some conflict. I do want to talk about um, civil liberties and national security a little bit. Uh, Can we actually just do it in the context of question and answer? Because we've been banging on for 45 minutes. Let's okay. bring everybody else in. We okay. actually did have a question about civil liberties on Twitter. So right, so let's start oh, with that well, one. There, you go. there okay. we go. So the question is, um, uh, start question, how realistic is the is a collapse of progressive social freedoms uh, after the election of Donald Trump? 
The collapse of progressive social... Could, could you be a little specific about what you mean by progressive social freedom? No, it's Twitter. You can't be specific on okay. Twitter. <laughs> uh, so, like, um, how, uh, gay marriage... Uh, well, I think it's going to be... Uh, unless he... Uh, even if he were to get a new nominee, just one. So there's a four-to-four four court now. Uh, obviously, I think Merrick Garland will be withdrawn um, uh, once the new president comes. You know, I think that's going to be over. But um, I think that he'd need... You need another justice... And you still can't get beyond a 6-3 on that decision. So um, uh, I, I don't see that they, the court would overturn the same-sex marriage guarantee this quickly. I just don't see that. John Roberts is uh, a public opinion-sensitive chief justice of the Supreme Court. Uh, we know this a little bit of the way he parsed out the Obamacare decision, which was pretty parsed in terms of... Uh, of that. I think he doesn't want to be the villain that takes away people's rights. I mean, uh, I think it's less secure on abortion, actually, than I think same-sex marriage. But uh, Donald Trump himself, it's unclear to me, even though his rhetoric in the campaign, uh, I just don't know what kind of social agenda he has. Ronald Reagan ran on a social agenda, and he put forth some things socially, but he was never super committed to it. And I do think that... Um, Donald Trump is not nearly as committed to that as he is economics um, and foreign policy. I just don't know that he's going to be inclined to, to pick a fight there. You know, every attack that they wage, the Republican Party, through Donald Trump or through Congress, on a particular group will eat away, even at this coalition that they constructed for this election, it will still eat away at that coalition. Um, and the Republicans may face pressure. The irony is that they would have faced pressure from their own constituency to do these things, but the pressure really on Trump comes from a different constituency. It's not the traditional Republican constituency. It's the working-class Democratic constituency. Mm -hmm. So it's a kind of fine line the Republicans have to walk, because if they overreach, they could find themselves fighting on both ends. They could find themselves fighting um, different constituencies. So I think it's really now the Republicans are looking to get as much done in the first two years before 2018 as they can, and they're gonna have, going to have to pick and choose. And he's going, he doesn't like to be the bad guy, and in, in, at least he doesn't want to be the villain yet. So it's really, Mike Pence has a very socially conservative agenda. He's the <coughs> vice president of the United States elect. Whether he's super influential, what I see now is happening is Mike Pence is the VP. My guess is he tries to crowd out Chris Christie and Rudy Giuliani and some other people who've been the policy advisors so that he can be the real policy person. If you don't see that happening, I don't see either Giuliani or Christie going after that particular element of social freedoms. I do think that he'll be under pressure on um, abortion, as always. You may see a reversion, a lot of these things, to states, and that's why you have to pay attention to state politics. Lots of state legislative seats and governorships are up in 2018. Again, staying engaged, watching state legislation on this. Any other questions? <coughs> One more question so far on Twitter, and uh, for those of you watching at home, you can uh, tweet us at questions at hashtag brown poli sci, um, and it actually is a historical question. How did racial and political pitting of uh, to get votes play into the 2008 and 2012 elections for uh, President Obama's wins? Well, uh, President Obama, I think, um, benefited from sort of a moment in time, which was that Democrats, particularly progressives, were very, very strongly mobilized against the Iraq War in 2006, which is unusual for a midterm election. But both Nancy Pelosi um, and Harry Reid did a very, very good job on getting people really out the door in the 2006 elections and winning the Senate and the House back. That gave the Democrats a very active coalition to build on for 2008. Plus, I think John McCain's choice of Sarah Palin may seem ironic now since she has more experience than Donald Trump, but was considered a strong liability. But John McCain didn't actually run a particularly racist campaign in 2008. Um, and he resisted some urges on that, the birther movement and some other things. So I think that didn't come up for <laughs> Obama to combat the way that it might have had a different candidate run, certainly Trump. And the economic crisis, I think, just swamped everything. And the Republicans were out and out blamed for that. And, I, and that's the same constituency that didn't vote for Hillary Clinton in some numbers this time voted for Barack Obama then mm. because he promised that he would get us out of the jam. And to a lot of extent, he did get us out of the jam, but not where people feel it um, <coughs> theoretically. Actually, they may feel it. One thing about inflation, there is inflation, but they've been really clever, corporate America, 
boxes of food, for example, are smaller. <coughs> Buy any box of cereal that you pay the exact same price you did two years ago, you get less food. Can of tuna fish, smaller. Soup cans, smaller. You look at anything, it's now packaged bigger with less content. That's inflation. You're paying the same price for getting and getting less. That's uh, that. Well, no, that's actually just stealing extra profit. That right. doesn't have to be inflation. Inflation means there's rising prices in the general level. But that's it does not cost what that is. More because you're not getting as much content. Commodity you prices. Boxes commodity prices have fallen. That can't be true. Okay. They're just stealing. All right. <laughs> semantics. No, it's not. It's, it's not semantics. They're just stealing. They're just stealing. But to me, as a consumer, I am paying more and getting less. Right. That's certainly true. Okay, but it's not inflation. Let's take, um, <laughs> let's take uh, questions from the audience. Um, so, first of all, thank you so much. This is really interesting. Um, I've been seeing some things online that are predicting that Hillary is going to win the uh, popular vote. Um, before 2000, this had happened, I think, two times in the history of the country. And now in the past 15 years, it's happened two times. Or maybe will. What do you think that is a trend increasingly divided? I mean, you said people are moving to live with people who think like them. Do you think that's causing some kind of trend in a difference in, in popular vote and electoral college? Um, yeah, the difference is not as big as it was in 2000. Gore, I think, won the popular vote by more than 300,000 votes. So um, I don't know if she's there yet, but she's... I think she's going to win it by more. Yeah, I think she's at one, the advantage in the, in the popular vote, I think it now is 1.3% or something. Um, so yeah, that raises questions, and we had this conversation in class this morning. So you look at the Electoral College, you say California, as long as California stays Democratic, and, and New York stays Democratic, um, and Illinois stays Democratic, big states, you are going to rack up sheer numbers of votes. So one of the options is to open up the Constitution and change the Electoral College. I'm not a big fan of opening up the Constitution, particularly in this particular <laughs> atmosphere and climate. I'm much more what fearful could go wrong? of <laughs> restricting rights. And I think the framers, the framers saw a few things. The framers made a lot of mistakes. We know that. One thing they anticipated was somebody like Trump winning the presidency. Mm -hmm. They saw this coming. Uh, they were not big fans of party for this reason. They didn't want the Congress to be unified with someone like this in the White House. But they set up checks and balances and separation of powers for this reason. Second, the Electoral College was designed to prevent a mistake. If the voters chose badly, the Electoral College could overturn it. That is the intent of the Electoral College. That no longer operates because most electors sign pledges to say that they would, they'll vote the way um, that the state votes. You could make, states can make, as Maine and Nebraska do, the Electoral College proportional in some way. So that if you win California, you win a portion of California, and the person who doesn't win the majority vote also wins electoral college votes. Mm -hmm. That would certainly make it better, I think, mm -hmm. and without having to change the Constitution. So that's where I, I am on the electoral college. Do you think that this election indicates a political realignment of any sort? Uh, do you think that uh, the Republican Party has now officially been taken over by right-wing populism and uh, now the uh, right-wing uh, neoliberal conservatism, as it were, or uh, Reaganomics is now out of power? And uh, the other part of that is, well, now that we've seen that the right changing, what do you think the left in the US and worldwide is going to look like now? Great question. You want to take that first? All right. Um, so the only tweet I did today was the following. I said, this is all I have to say about the election. And the line was, the era of neoliberalism is over. The era of neo-nationalism has just begun. Mm -hmm. And that's what I think is going on. So that's the, the short answer to that. So to unpack that a little bit, Professor Schiller can talk to the specifics of the American context, but there is no left left. It's already had its lunch eaten. Uh, the SPD in Germany got 19% in Baden-Württemberg. That's, that's like literally like the, the Democrats getting 19% in Rhode Island, right? Like they're dead. They're two electoral cycles away from death. The British Labour Party has now elected Jeremy Corbyn twice. Jeremy Corbyn will never get more than 30% of the popular vote. Those 30% are going to love him until they die, but he's never going to win an election. And then the major parties that are not like that, for example, the Swedish SAP, which used to be able to get elected by putting a dead dog up with a red rosette on it, can't get above 30% of the vote, and they have to deal with a right-wing party called the Swedish Democrats, who are far from democratic, but really know who's a Swede and who's not. 
so they're in trouble. And that's the European story. Now, does that get replicated here? One of the virtues, perhaps, is the fact that America doesn't have real parties. So you don't get those types of dynamics, and the party system is more fluid, even though it's dominated by two. But I will leave it to Professor Schiller to talk about that. Um, yeah, I think it, uh, the short answer is it, it very much all depends. First of all, I don't think the left is to, the left. If you're going to call the Democratic Party the left, then uh, it's not at all dead. You know, Hillary Clinton got 59 mil plus million votes. That's not dead. That's not even close to dead. That's not even on life support. That's just an unlucky and misguided election in a couple of states, getting back to the Electoral College. So that's not in the least bit gone. And there are 193 members of the House who are Democrats and 47 U.S. Senators who are Democrats. There were few, many fewer governors. So they're not, they're not at all dead. But what they stand for, how they articulate their policies, as I totally agree with Mark White on this, has to be just completely renovated using some of Bernie Sanders' uh, populist rhetoric, but also programs that have not worked for lots of different people have to get renovated, revamped, redirected, be more effective, um, and not just lip service. And I think that's um, the idea that the government will do lots of things for you. I think that's under siege. I think that's under challenge. I think as strongly as it's probably going to be since Ronald Reagan. It's this is George Bush didn't go after, George W. didn't go after him the same way. But I think you'll see social welfare programs reconfigured. Certainly Paul Ryan would like to do that, but he'd like to do it on Medicare and Social Security because they're very expensive. Medicare in particular, Social Security is mostly but not totally paid for. <laughs> the problem is that the demographic that elects Republicans is on the older side. Mm -hmm. Trump in particular is pretty friendly with older people in Florida. You know, and if you take away their Medicare and you limit their Social Security, they will not have the money to join golf clubs. And I just think that I'm serious. Mm -hmm. That's the way he'll think. What does this do to my kid's bottom line and our business? And I think that's not going to happen. I just think that he's going to say no to that. But I do think that uh, Democrats have to rethink it. I think that Democrats have to, as you say, explain themselves more to people about what they want to do and why they want to do it. And I don't believe that the movement that says that government can do good things for people is gone and will disintegrate. But I think do things for people has to include not just people who are traditionally oppressed or discriminated against or who are traditionally in economic need, but people who are working and feel like they can't really get ahead. And they like their kid to be able to go to college, but they can't afford it. Or they wanted to have a job in their town, but the job doesn't exist. What do you do for those people? I think the Democrats have to go back to that model and that group. And there have been complaints about this in the Democratic Party since the Clintons. So the Dingles of the world, John Dingle was one of the longest serving members of Congress from Michigan, and his people used to say, we're a flyover party. They fly from New York to LA and San Francisco and back again. Mm -hmm. They never touch down in Cleveland. So I think that's where the Democratic Party has to do rebuilding, and they're gonna have to redo building locally <laughs> at the local level and the congressional level. Um, and I do think one other thing that might or might not come out of this, we have to see what the problems will do, right? Will they? Will they follow through with Trump promises or not? That is a big deal. If they do what Mark suggests they're going to do, they're not, their corporate uh, Republicans will stay with the Republican Party. If they don't, then corporate Republicans may decide. We, and if the social stuff gets out of hand in terms of restriction of civil liberties and racism and discrimination, then some Republicans may say, I can only stand so much. Mm -hmm. But I don't think those will be the Wall Street corporate people. Second, the angry voter. I think there are a lot of people who are angry, but I think they were whipped into an angry frenzy by the media and by Trump and by Bernie Sanders, right? Get angry. You're not getting what you need. Get angry. I'm not persuaded they were naturally that angry before that happened, but they've been really angry. Had Clinton won, that block would have been nearly unmovable, hmm. nearly unaddressable. In other words, she, could, she would have tried to reach them, but it would have been incredibly hard with a Republican House, maybe a Democratic Senate, Policy-wise, it would have been hard to reach them, but also just that they would even listen to her and accept her. It would have been digging, attacking, digging, attacking, nonstop from today until the next election. Mm -hmm. It would have been really impossible to reach them. And so now when you think, we can't reach them anyway, they're, you know, what she said, terms she used about them, <laughs> now their guy won. They feel empowered. If they feel empowered to do things like attack people of color or attack immigrants, we have to step in as a community and a nation and stop it where we see it. That's clear. But if Trump can slightly pivot <laughs> away from that kind of rhetoric 
to the let's do things. I want him, I wanted things to get along. I want people to get along. If he can even tone it down a bit, because he'll say, "Look, I won. We won. We won now. We don't have to be slight as quite as angry." If that can happen, that moves the needle a little bit forward. That's a big if, I understand that, but it would never have happened had she won. And 59 million, or let's say 39 million of the 59 million who are angry would have stayed really angry. And there would have just been no hope, no light at the end of the tunnel to get past or through this kind of anger. Mm -hmm. And so that's, it's, as someone said to me, it's too big a risk. That's fine, you can have that opinion. But that's the reality of a Trump win versus a Clinton win. Um, I just have a question about polling and how you think that might have affected the outcome because I, I, or in my personal opinion, I feel like there were a lot of people who grew complacent because there was this overconfidence in Clinton's win and because the media is or was well, critical of both of them, but they did make it seem like Clinton was going to win closer to the election. So do you think that that caused some people to stay out just because they felt like, you know, it's Clinton's going to win, like I don't have to compromise my dislike for her or my lack of agreement with her to get out and vote? Because like the whole call was to be like, no, it's, a, it's about being against Trump, but if I saw polls that said that Hillary was meant to win in every state, I can understand not feeling the need to also participate. And do you think An that that another, is another one? Can, can I get two sentences yeah. in this one? So just, uh, you know, uh, Professor Schiller said, you know, the, the polls weren't wrong, people didn't turn up, whatever, right? But, you know, polls have been wrong a few times now, right? There's been the Brexit thing. They're very wrong in a lot of the European elections that have been going on. So there's something more than sort of that going on, I think. Whether it's preference falsification or people are figuring things out, I, I'm not entirely sure. But I saw one when I was coming down here. It was on um, CNN. I went to CNN's website, which I've never done before. God, what a crap website. But they had exit exit polling data. So I was going through the exit polling data and it breaks it down by everything, age and all the rest of it. Right? And I saw this one and I really puzzled over it. It said that 24% of Donald Trump's support came from people earning between $100,000 and $200,000 a year. Now, if that's 24% of the total number of people who voted for him, that means that every single person and someone else who earns that income bracket because of the skew of the income distribution voted for Trump. That, that can't be right. I mean, that's just, com that's complete, not 24% of his, his, no, 24% yeah. of the total volume of people who voted for Trump <laughs> earn between 100 and 200,000. That can't, no, there aren't that many people in the United States earning that's that debt money. That's, that's weird totally one. weird. The so, New York Times has a, a, a pretty good uh, exit polling site that has a lot of this breakdown, and they do it by category. So 24% of people who earn that money would have voted for Trump. They had it as 24% because it added up to 100 for the uh, total of the vote. It was wrong. really weird. So anyway, well, my point that. being, right, there's a lot of schlock out there. Okay. Don't believe everything they tell you. Uh, no, but I did, let, let, getting back to your point about that, about polling and about complacency, you hit on something when you asked the question, which was that people felt that they didn't have to go out and vote for her because they didn't want to go out and vote for her, but they were worried about Trump winning. If they had to, they would. Um, I think the people who were enthusiastic about her or very scared of Trump voted early when they could. And that was the big problem in Pennsylvania and Michigan. And that's what I would do if I were, I mean, it's going to be very difficult for the Democrats to do this, but I would push and push and push for early voting, expanded early voting in these states over time so you can get more of that vote out the door early. Um, so I do think that those people voted. So the people left were people who were not liking either candidate very much um, and in the states that had early voting, but the ones that didn't have early voting, I don't think that flies. I think it looked really tight over the weekend, and I think people thought he could win, he could win. Um, so in the end of the day, if somebody feels that they want this person to win or they're really scared about somebody else, they get out the door to vote. And if they didn't and they said, oh, my goodness, I wish I could have voted, I might have made a difference, that may or may count four years from now. I don't know. But uh, if you've registered to vote, typically you, you vote. I mean, not, that's not true. Of course, 55%, 55.6% of America voted this time around registered to vote. So No, eligible voters. Mm. So it's, it's a complicated thing. I don't think I'm going to blame the polls or the mainstream media for this. I think it was just a combination of liabilities plus a guy with a very slick, attractive-sounding message. Now he has to deliver on it.
I, I'd only differ on this one. I mean, I don't have a television, so it's very hard for me to judge. But it does seem to be the case that every single publication that I picked up, the Washington Post, the New York Post came out for Hillary, right? I mean, everybody was like, yes, yes, this is it. He's beyond the pale, blah, blah, blah. I think to a lot of people, and we saw this again with the Brexit result, and we saw this with the Scottish independence referendum, people have been fed up, are very fed up being told what to do and what to think by people who think they know better. And I think there's a really vicious feedback mechanism in that, and I don't think we should underprice that. We shouldn't. But I, would, I wonder if the same negative effect would have happened if she was not a woman and her name wasn't Clinton. Hmm. So I think in this ta case, I don't think we can test it as cleanly as we'd like. There's two questions, or three uh -huh. questions. So Are there any Twitter questions? <laughs> okay, so. Just, on these women have been waiting. Yeah. So you want to and then we'll do, and then we'll do some Twitters. Yeah. There you go. It seems as though uh, Trump is involved in some lawsuits. I'm just wondering, is there any precedent for that? And like, what is the worst or best outcome? Well, actually, <laughs> one of my friends is suing him. Um, so th there's a case in Scotland. Um, Scotland falls under the European Directives on Data Protection, and he has a golf course up there. And Scotland has this annoying thing called right-of-way access, which means you can walk wherever you want. So his employees filmed people on his golf course as if this was a bad thing, but in fact they're perfectly allowed to do so. So my friend's a solicitor advocate, he's one of the top lawyers in Scotland, and he's actually suing Donald Trump because basically he's violated their privacy under the Data Protection Acts. I don't think this will cause him a microsecond of sleep because all of this stuff is civil suits. There's no criminal suits involved. So the, the tr he, his assets will go into a blind trust. It will be run by his family. The conciliary for the family will take care of these things. They will be settled out of court if they ever come to court. And uh, very much, you will, it will just disappear. Um, yeah, the only problem is um, sometimes they don't. And he might, uh, in civil suits, the, the, press, the big precedent for us with Bill Clinton was sued in a civil suit by Paula Jones. And um, as part of that civil suit, he was deposed and he was asked about his relationship with Monica Lewinsky. He um, said that he did not have sexual relations with Monica Lewinsky, which was kind of a lie under oath. Um, it's debatable, but he debated that. And so that is considered perjury. He, that's perjury. And so if that's perjury, that's what's called a high crime misdemeanor in the Constitution subject to impeachment. So the Republicans used obstruction mm -hmm. of justice and perjury as high crimes and misdemeanors to launch the impeachment proceedings against Bill Clinton that started in 1998 and then finished in January with an acquittal by the Senate in 1999. So, and that's what was floating around also about impeaching Hillary Clinton. So uh, a civil suit where they, a judge rules, and if he draws the wrong judge, an Obama judge or even a George W. Bush judge, if he draws those district court judges and they say you have to testify and he lies, that would be subject to yeah. impeachment. But the House is Republican, and it's unlikely they'd impeach him. But there is precedent for that. Criminal is totally different. I mean, criminal, they, so the Supreme Court, he took it to the Supreme Court, Bill Clinton, said, you shouldn't allow this suit to go on while I'm president. Wait till I'm done. And the Supreme Court said, no, that's OK. We're letting it go forward now. And so then he was, then he was deposed, and then everything else happened after that. So there is precedent for it in a civil suit. And it depends which judge, um, uh, who's uh, a federal district court judge is appointed for life which judge he draws if it's, it's lodged in federal court. So we go to the gentleman and then the young lady, or you want to do? Would Bernie have won? <laughs> I'll so. I don't think so, because if you, if you look at some of the income numbers and demographics um, uh, on the, the turnout and who voted for whom, I don't see the people who were of higher income um, voting for Bernie Sanders or better educated voting for Bernie Sanders. He was going to raise taxes on them. So I just think that cohort um, might not have come to the table. And so I just think that would have been a difficult thing. And I don't know. There were a lot of women who supported Bernie Sanders. But if he had knocked Hillary Clinton out of this race as the nominee, I'm not sure there wouldn't have been also a negative reverb. That's a double negative. I think there might have been a negative reverb among women for Bernie. Uh, I'm not, I, I don't think he could have won. I don't think Joe Biden could have won. Um, I think this was, we want something brand new. Um, and so we'll never know. It's a counterfactual we cannot test. It's another one of those ones that does it, you know, is the fault within ourselves or the fault within the stars, right? So are there so many factors that meant that you could have put Jesus himself up and he would have lost as a Democrat? Well, the, <laughs> let's, re let's remember that Senator Clinton went in with some of the highest negatives of any candidate imaginable. 
And if you had someone who didn't have those negatives that was able to make a positive case, whose website didn't look like some kind of Rorschach test of liberal policies we like, and actually had a message then and was able to confront directly on Trump on other than you're a horrible sexist man, which is all we really got, then the outcome might have been different, but we can't test it directly. Yeah, I would say that differently, but um, uh, <laughs> but I, I agree with Mark's sentiment that, that a candidacy matters. Um, and I think the theme of this, unfortunately, I think for women and unfortunately for Hillary Clinton, will be to blame Hillary Clinton as a candidate, as a flawed candidate. <laughs> And we've seen that before with Hillary Clinton. So, uh, I, but, but is she not a flawed candidate? My point is that that <laughs> that's what th I think there were flaws in her candidacy. But I I think that given the message of Trump and the, uh, also that we typically but not always switch presidential parties after eight years, um, I think that mattered. And it's just a question of um, unless we do you know follow up focus groups with people and say why did you do what you do and by the way if that doesn't happen in the next six months we can't do it or three months mm -hmm. because the minute the Republicans or Trump does something unattractive to the people who voted for Trump they're gonna lie about the fact that they voted for Trump so there's no way <laughs> we're really gonna get this done I think in political science but but um, how about we imprison them all and then they're yeah, they're they're got a treatment no, group and then no we got no okay about fine any imprisonment whatsoever. oh yeah that's right we're gonna do that anyway we're not gonna do that sorry. <laughs> Um, so it seems like tr um, so America is gonna probably have a more isolationist policy as far as like the, in the international sphere. Though like who knows because like Trump changes whatever he says every single time. But um, it currently like kind of looks like it. And also the rest of Europe is also going into very nationalistic, very kind of like also like, isolationist policy too. And I'm wondering like what this means for the increase in globalization and like the international relations, I suppose. Right. So let's take those as separate things. Let's leave the IR bit for a minute, right? Um, have the Europeans been free riding on the Americans' contributions to NATO since 1947? Yes. Um, is it about time that the richest countries in the world started paying at least 2% of their own GDP in defense? Yes. Uh, has the EU been writing checks it can never cash by extending its influence all the way up to the borders of Russia and hoping that they'll get away with it with having no, nothing to back it up whatsoever? Yes. Has Donald Trump called them on this? Yes. Is it a good thing? In my opinion, yes. America needs a more isolationist foreign policy. If isolation is defined as don't get into stupid wars. Now, remember the guy who said that was Obama, who hasn't closed down Guantanamo and is still dropping bombs in Afghanistan. The Middle East is still a total mess. The liberal interventionist humanitarianist agenda, which has killed hundreds of thousands of people in that arc of conflict, extending from North Africa all the way through the Middle East, has been an unmitigated disaster. At the end of the day, if we do less in the world and the Europeans have to look after themselves and come to their own accommodation with Russia, that would be better for everybody concerned. We need to do less, not more. Um, okay. Um, I'm a realist. I never thought that would happen. <laughs> I think, I think the, the translation in domestic politics of that uh, is that Americans... Um, it took a long time for Americans to turn on the idea of the Iraq War. Uh, Afghanistan was a little bit of an easier sell because you could identify Osama bin Laden and the Taliban as uh, protecting him in Afghanistan after 9-11, but Iraq was a really hard sell, and uh, there was the beginning of massive distrust of government information. And then it took about four years for public opinion to shift on Iraq. That's a long time. And hundreds of billions of dollars. I mean, a tremendous amount of money. And George W. Bush came into office uh, with unified, well, tied Senate, but unified uh, ha Republican House and a tied Senate, and he beat Gore um, in the Electoral College. <laughs> and he came in as a very experienced guy compared to Donald Trump, right? He was the son of a president. He had all this brain trust around him, some from uh, Nixon administration, a lot from the Nixon Ford administration, some from his father's administration. Dick Cheney is his vice president. You would have thought a man with this kind of experience and these kind of people around him, Colin Powell, Condoleezza Rice, all these people would not make colossal foreign policy mistakes that were very expensive in human life and also in money. And we didn't know necessarily at the time that they were colossal mistakes. Um, but he did. And then we had the banking crisis and then the Great Recession. So one of the things you think about Trump is it's very disconcerting that he has no government experience and no apparent interest in policy at all. 
and no idea how the military works or foreign policy. On the other hand, as Mark has pointed out, he's probably not going to be easily driven by people with a long-standing foreign policy agenda, and he's not going to be as anxious to exert military power when it costs a lot of money because that's not what he ran and won on. That's not He's not vested in that reputation. Mm -hmm. That can be good in the way of keeping us out of conflicts we should stay out of, but it can be bad if you think we should intervene on humanitarian grounds. The point is, you can have a lot of experience and still make a lot of really bad mistakes. And you can have no experience and make bad mistakes, but we don't know that he will make the same kind of mistakes because he doesn't have that force of people with a prior agenda pushing him forward. Hmm. We don't know. Um, we've gotten several questions on Twitter about um, climate change and what are the implications of a Trump presidency <laughs> for that. Um, if you could speak to like the Paris uh, Climate Agreement and all that stuff, and so, how we see that playing out. So you can check the Watson, Watson website. I was um, asked, well, along with the rest of the faculty here, to what should happen in the first 100 days. And I don't know if anybody saw my post. I said, well, I'll tell you what's not going to happen. And I posted a map of heat signatures across the planet, which I downloaded two days ago, and a link to a Twitter feed for a climate scientist who's actually in the Arctic. The, the, uh, the average temperature for Providence in November is 50, the average high is 53. The average is 51.7. Um, every single day this month has been about 10 degrees above that. And this isn't local to us. We had 270, 70 degree days last week. It's roasting. The entire Arctic is five degrees above normal. Any, and we now have a government who says that he says, and he said he was joking, but he did say it, that this is a hoax perpetuated by the Chinese government. And we know that the Republican Party en masse refuses to believe in climate change or global warming. So this is, an un, this is your disaster. This is an unmitigated disaster. Paris is already redundant. It is completely redundant. Two degrees Celsius, we're already there. Forget about it, right? So it's just a question of you know, when the water in Boston Harbor starts to hit the million dollar condos and then maybe people will wake up a bit and it's probably coming a lot sooner than we think in that regard. Uh, would it have been any different with uh, Clinton in charge? I don't think that the sort of, I like to call it the nudge liberalism incremental approach that, that, uh, that those politicians seem to uh, favour, they would have done a focus group to find out if people liked climate change or not, and they probably would have found out many people don't like it, so they probably would have left it alone. I don't think they would have done anything different. They would have both been equally hopeless. And uh, if you go to the Watson website, you'll find the link, and you can check the map yourself and, and build your own, and basically, we're roasting. So there we go. Knock yourselves out. Um. On climate change, I would, uh, you know, the incremental uh, set of regulations that the President Obama has issued over the last eight years, um, even George Bush issued one that was pretty good on climate change before he left as a Republican, but the Democratic President has used his regulatory authority in pretty sweeping ways, at least domestically. It's the international productivity, I think, that's the big problem, and developing countries do not want to limit their productivity, and they do not want to limit their emissions, and we will soon be, you know, not the big cause of this problem, and so it's very difficult, particularly with globalization and economic trade, to insist on people do that. We, we put these safeguards in, theoretically, when China was let in, you know, to the w, most favored nation status in WTO, theoretically they're there, but they're not enforced. But I do think domestically the president has done a lot to get around Congress to at least limit carbon emissions. He's been struck down by the court, Supreme Court big time once. Mm -hmm. And then another lower court, he had to tweak a regulation. But generally, he's now it's going to take a long time for President Trump to repeal all those regulations. And if corporations have already fitted their fa factories with this technology and spent the money, they're not going to go backwards. Mm -hmm. However... If you, if your generation says climate change is the most important thing and that's the catalyst to get your voting turnout above 48%, which is less than half of all people between the age of 18 and 29 vote, if that's the thing that drives you over the edge, then that is the thing that will change the political configuration in this country. There isn't any question if that number goes up by 10 or 15 mm -hmm. points, even in the midterm elections, especially the presidential elections, you're not gonna get a Donald Trump elected. So that's up to you guys. And if climate change becomes that big motivating force, then so be it. But make it something and get your generation out the door because this is, you're inheriting the planet such as it is, warmer, that it is warmer. Um, is, there, is there more Twitter questions? There's a woman in the back has a question. Do you have a question? Yeah, I have a question. So I know. 
I know there's been a lot of discussion among our peers about, you know, not being ready to listen to Trump supporters and try and really understand what's going on here beyond, you know, racism and misogyny and some of the issues that we've talked about today. Um, so I was just wondering sort of how you think we can open ourselves up to start to actually understand these issues, you know, in the ways that you've been speaking about today economically and things like that, um, and why that's an important thing to do rather than just sort of close our uh, ears to that discussion. Well, the first one is because there's more of them than there is of you. So closing off isn't an option. The second one is this, and this is the, the, the there was a whole series of pieces on Vox.com about basically, they are all deplorables. Don't let them tell you it's about economics, blah, blah, blah. Well, again, like I said earlier, let, let's assume the coalition is, you know, one third sexist, one third racist, and one third genuinely economically disturbed. The only thing that's malleable to public policy is the economic part. What are you going to do, put like 20 million people on the naughty step and say, you're racist, I can't deal with you? Well, they still get to vote. So not talking to them, not engaging is not an option. So you have to engage. What's the common language you can understand? That if you simply look at income and wealth statistics, the distribution of rewards, the way the assets have been channeled, how the fact that like basically old people, the following is absolutely true. Um, all old people are not rich. All rich people are old, right? There's an intergenerational put going on here because when you're basically making sure that people with assets and incomes get bailed and all the rest of it, right, and their pensions are secure, you're piling up debt that the next generation has to pay off, so their growth chances are lower. So there's lots of ways in which young people in particular can engage across lines that aren't just, you're a racist. We can talk about fairness between generations. We can talk about fairness across the income distribution. We can talk about opportunity in different parts of the country, in different neighborhoods, the zip code lottery for education. There's lots of ways in which this can be engaged. But you have to engage. It's simply not an option not to engage. Um, I, I, would, I would even dial it down to just the local level. Um, and I've been saying this for a while, and I, I'm going to continue to say it, that uh, when you see somebody who might, um, let's say, uh, 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 plant facilities at Brown. Um, somebody who is cleaning a classroom or somebody who's fixing a light bulb or somebody who's fixing a heater or something. You know, the first place to start is say hello. Yeah. Just say hello. Uh, your generation is really intense, but you're also on your phone all the time with your earbuds in and you don't look up. And that generation that voted for Trump is not that same generation. They look up, they talk, they, and if you stop and say, say, what's going on? I mean, I do that because as you, some of you know, you know, I talk a lot about politics, so people come up to me and talk to me, and I want to talk to people and figure out what's going on. You don't have to go to Michigan or Wisconsin or Pennsylvania. Rhode Island is a state where Trump did pretty well, and you can find people to talk to about the kinds of issues that you want to engage them on, whether it's immigration, um, whether it's racism, sexism, economic mobility. There are plenty of people in this particular state, in this particular community, on this campus, that you could stop to and talk to and say hello and bridge some gaps just as a starting point. Mm -hmm. And that's what I would recommend. So we'll do one more Twitter and then call it. <laughs> Does everybody feel better? You feel better? <laughs> we, we have, make, make sure you're leaving feeling just a little better. Uh, uh, so, I guess like we Jimmy have one. Carter, I feel your pain. <laughs> uh, so I guess we have joke for old people. <laughs> uh, Put in your credit card. I got cards. it. Um, we have one question um, <laughs> uh, about um, like how, uh, because Republicans uh, inherently try to limit government. How can you hold them um, accountable? Um, to be successful in their policy imp implementation because, you know, by definition, the policy they're trying to implement is less government. Well, they, they, we've just had a Democratic president for eight years uh, who it did expand the size of the federal government in a couple of different ways, as did George Bush with the Medicare Prescription Drug Act. But you have Obamacare, and that's going to be a big lightning rod, and the Republicans will either try to repeal it outright or change it. It's unclear yet what they'll do. Um, and, you know, their efforts to undo the previous administration's work, Dodd-Frank, et cetera, these will all take mostly legislative efforts, maybe some regulatory efforts, but mostly legislation. So when that legislation is being heard in Congress or discussed, and there are certain corporations or businesses that support it, you want to find out who they are, what they sell, 
you want to figure out maybe you could figure out how to boycott them or make it known that they're supporting the repeal of this. There are ways now that you are empowered on social media to be incredibly forceful without having to go to D.C. that my generation wasn't. And so I would look for, pay attention to who the primary contributors are to the key people who are sponsoring this legislation for repeals of climate change or, or Obamacare or um, anything else like that, and find out if there are corporate ties where you can make it known that you're not going to consume particular products of companies that support this party. And that's a very, it's always worked in American politics, and I think it still will. Mm -hmm. And you can organize in a way that is far, I think, more effective and more public than we could. I'm going to have one last question, and then we'll call it a day. Hi. Um, so in, in like my poli-sci class, we've been talking more on the international justice and how during the Obama administration, unlike Bush administration, uh, like we've, the U.S. has been more friendly with like the International Criminal Court and the U.N. and actually been getting things done, which like I, uh, which like those organizations did not or were not able to get a lot of things done when the U.S. was really antagonistic towards it. And so, and also like um, Israel is actually, I mean, like the um, pre, uh, the Prime Minister Israel seems to be pretty happy that Trump has won. And so I'm. So I want, I'm wondering like how, what, what this means for the, what, the international justice as a whole and also, uh, and also what's going on in the Middle East with like Israel and Palestine and, and those, like that general. Country. All that's one question, right? <laughs> <laughs> Good question to end on, you wanna take that? Okay. Well, I'm saying absolutely nothing about Israel and Palestine, you forget that. Um, <laughs> What does it mean? I think that Rudy Giuliani and a couple of his supporters and funders, like the guy from Nevada, are very concerned about Israel, and I think they'll try and lobby hard. Whether Trump really has anything to say about that or any interest in that, I don't know, and time will tell. Um, in terms of the rest of it, you know, they got stuff done. What did they get done? Could you tell me what they got done? Um, so apparently a lot of the persecution, uh, so uh, not pers <laughs> I mean, prosecutions, and a lot of those kind of things were able to like proceed apparently with like mm -hmm. a, with more US backing. Like All right, so, so the yeah. ICC managed to you know go after a few more guys from Equatorial Guinea or something like that and, and, and put them on the naughty step. Um, but Greece has still got a migrants crisis. Um, Turkey is behaving <laughs> extremely badly. Um, Hungary is basically imprisoning its, its, uh, its um, press and shutting down papers. Um, and the notion that sort of there's a thing out there called international justice and, and we're doing good on it, I, I think is an incredible distraction from what's actually going on. I think you need, you need to watch on who's floated for the Secretary of State position. I think that's going to give you a very good indication. Um, the Republican Party has been a very staunch ally of Israel for a very, very long time, and the conservative wing of the party is fine with that, so I think that would continue <laughs> no matter which Republican got elected, if the Republican got elected. But I do think that you want to watch who the Trump administration wants to put in as, uh, for Secretary of State. Remember, all cabinet appointments have to be confirmed by the U.S. Senate, so it's gonna be, it'll take a while to replace those that are already in in, in those positions. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you.